Well, good morning, church. Uh, I chose this song because it's kind of been our anthem during this phase of growth and building um, with all the crazy stuff that's been going on lately. Most of you haven't gotten to uh, to see that our new building is looking more and more like a building uh, with every passing week. So this song reminds us that this building and this body of believers that we call Faith Family Church is being built for one purpose, the glory of Christ. So uh, before we listen to Pastor Dan preach, gather around with your family and let's sing All Glory Be to Christ. Should nothing of our efforts stand, no legacy survive, unless the Lord does raise the house in vain, its builders strive. To you who boast tomorrow's gain, tell me, what is your life? A mist that vanishes at dawn, all glory be to Christ. All glory be to Christ our King, all glory be to Christ. His rule and reign will ever sing, all glory be to Christ. His will be done, His kingdom come on earth as is above, who is Himself our daily bread, praise Him, the Lord of love. Let living water satisfy the thirsty without price. We'll take a cup of kindness, yet all glory be to Christ. All glory be to Christ our King. All glory be to Christ. His rule and reign will ever sing, all glory be to Christ. When on the day the great I am, the faithful and the true, the Lamb who was for sinners slain is making all things new. Behold, our God shall live with us and be our steadfast light, and we shall ere his people be. All glory be to Christ. All glory be to Christ our King. All glory be to Christ. His rule and reign will ever sing, all glory be to Christ. All glory be to Christ our King, all glory be to Christ. His rule and reign will ever sing, all glory be to Christ. Well, good morning, everyone, or whenever you're watching this video or listening to this on podcast. Uh, uh, we're, we live in unique, uh, historic times, and uh, it's unfortunate that we have to meet this way, but uh, uh, in our efforts to try to love our neighbors and uh, try to be a help to our, the society around us, we're just glad that we can use modern technology uh, to still keep in touch with all of you. And I hope that uh, all of you, like me, miss gathering together with your church family. Now, I'm a social introvert, so I'm functioning just fine, especially because when I go to work, I'm the only guy in my building, and I'm just happy as a clam getting work done. Um, but I do miss my church family. There's something special about uh, gathering together every Sunday with my church family. So I hope that's the same for you. And you might want to ask yourself, if you don't find yourself missing your church family, why is that? Is that just because you needed a break from children's ministry? I get that. Uh, but but deep down, we should want to be with our fellow believers. So I hope that you're sensing that, and I hope you're making good use of the time. 
if you have more free time because of this. Uh, it's an important time for us to trust in the Lord and to seek to love and care for one another uh, and, uh, and to trust the Lord even through historic times like this. Well, let's go ahead and begin in prayer, and then we'll uh, look at our text. Dear Heavenly Father, please be gracious to us. Heal us and protect us, comfort and encourage us, humble us, make us more dependent on you, give us great confidence in your sovereignty. Lord, we come to you today because we need the truth. We need to be reminded of the truth, we need to be taught the truth. Please, Father, caution us against falsehood and give us confidence in the truth. And as I open up the words uh, of, of, of the, the Lord here today, uh, I pray the prayer of Moses from Deuteronomy 32. May my teaching drop as the rain, my speech distill as the dew, like gentle rain upon the tender grass. For I will proclaim the name of the Lord and ascribe greatness to our God. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. They were living in troubled times. Big things were happening. Ordinary people felt helpless and out of control. The forces of darkness were on the rise. Enter our heroes, Frodo Baggins and Samwise Gamgee. Two short, ordinary hobbits from the Shire found themselves on a quest to save the world from the evil Lord Sauron by casting his ring of power into the volcano from which it was made, destroying it and his power. Their quest was far from easy. It was full of danger and disappointment. Enemies lurked everywhere. Friends sometimes failed them. The plans they made kept changing because of unforeseen events. They constantly had to question who they could trust and who they could not. At one point in their quest, as Frodo and Sam were crossing into Mordor, the land of their evil enemy, Frodo thought back longingly to the Shire, and he gloomily predicted that he probably would never see his home ever again. Plucky Sam piped up and said, We may yet, Mr. Frodo, we may yet. Those of us who are believers in Christ, who have had our sins forgiven by admitting and turning from our sins and relying on Christ's work on the cross alone, are like these hobbits in several ways. We, like they, have an important quest. We, like they, have many enemies. We, like they, live during uncertain, eventful times, times in which it seems the forces of darkness are on the rise. We wonder how we can determine friend from foe. We wonder if we have the right resources for our journey. We wonder if we will ever succeed. But unlike Sam, who could only encourage himself with a wishful guess that perhaps success and safe passage home were theoretically possible, we can have confidence that we will succeed. Today's sermon is about both caution and confidence. We need to be warned about the dangers that we face, especially from false teachers and false teaching, so that we will be cautious. But we also need to be assured that we will succeed so that we can have confidence. The Apostle John's words in our passage today give us both caution and confidence. Turn to 1 John chapter 2. Now, unless you're listening to this sermon in the car, I strongly uh, urge you to get yourself a Bible and follow along. You'll get a lot more out of this. Well, before we start reading the passage, let me recap our series through 1 John, which we're calling Basics for Believers. John is giving us basic truths about the Christian life. He also uses basic, simple language, yet he often says very profound things. As we've seen, a helpful way to look at this little letter is through a series of of three tests. Three tests for the basic elements of Christianity. You've heard of the periodic table of elements. We've been talking about three basic elements of true Christianity. Truth, light, and love. And three tests, one for each element. And if you don't pass all three tests, it's a pretty clear indication that you don't have true Christianity. There's the truth test, things we must believe. There's the light test, the way we must live, or our morality. And then there's the love test, who, what, and how we love. Today's passage has to do with the truth test, people who oppose the truth and people who have the truth. And this passage doesn't just give us more truth that we can test our faith 
by. It does do that. But it also gives us great confidence in the truth we have received, if we have received it. So please uh, follow along with me if you uh, can as I read 1 John chapter 2, verses 18 through 27. Children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. Therefore we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain that they all are not of us. But you have been anointed by the Holy One, and you all have knowledge. I write to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and because no lie is of the truth. Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, he who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he made to us, eternal life. I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you. But the anointing that you receive from him abides in you, and you have no need that anyone should teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about everything, and is true, and is no lie, just as he has taught you, abide in him. This is the word of the Lord. First, a few observations. Notice how John begins this passage with the word children. This is something we've seen throughout the letter. Uh, at this point, it's a term of endearment. He's also modeling Christian love and concern for us. And I think he's also letting us know that we need to listen up. He is an experienced, older man in the faith. He is literally an elder in many different ways. And of course, he's an apostle, and he is being used by the Holy Spirit to write inspired truth for us here. So I think there's also a subtle, hey, listen up, I've got something important to tell you, you children. Also, you notice there's a whole lot of us versus them language going on here. Uh, John is talking about two different camps here. He likes stark contrast. You see that throughout uh, the entire book. Us versus them, or sometimes you versus them. He's talking to his audience, including himself. So he's using what we call second person plural. He's talking to a group of people as you, whereas uh, those of you from the South have a far more efficient way of saying that, y'all. He's basically saying, y'all have truth. But also notice the themes of caution and confidence here. We have two purpose statements, two places where he says, I write, and they both have to do with the truth. Uh, he says, I write in both verses 21 and 26. He writes to warn and caution about those trying to deceive them in verse 26, and he writes to encourage and give confidence because they know the truth in verse 21. Now, I'm not a big fan of alliteration in sermons just for the sake of it, but I do find it helpful uh, both as a preacher and as a listener, to have some rational structure to organize my thoughts. So I think we can better understand this passage by looking at three A's. No, Sarah, that's not a joke about Canadians. I mean three words that begin with the letter A that will caution us and give us confidence. Three A's. The age, the antichrists, and the anointed. The age, the antichrists, and the anointed. Point number one, the age. Notice verse 18. It is the last hour. Literally, if you look at the Greek, he's saying, the last hour it is. Now, he doesn't say it because he's a Jedi master like Master Yoda. That's a, this is a Greek grammatical uh, method to show emphasis. So you put the most important word first in the sentence, the last hour it is. And this is one of many uh, references throughout the New Testament of a theme throughout the New Testament and even the Old Testament of last days or last times. Many New Testament authors refer to the last days. In Acts chapter 2, verse 17, Luke quotes Peter, who says that the miracles at Pentecost were a fulfillment of prophecies about the last days from the Old Testament. In 2 Timothy 3.1, Paul talks about the last days as a future event, but one that is full of character flaws that sound a lot like his day and our day. In Hebrews 1.2, the author says that in the past, God spoke by his prophets, but that in these last days... He has spoken by his son, Jesus. In James 5.3, James condemns wealthy people who store up temporary and not eternal riches in these last days. And in Jude verse 18 uh, of his letter, he calls them the, the last times and warns that they would be characterized by many leaving the faith and attacking the teachings of the apostles. 
In 1 Peter uh, 1, verse 20, Peter speaks about Christ as having been foreknown in eternity past, but made manifest or revealed in these last times. And others refer to these events happening at the end of the ages. So what does it mean? What does John mean by last hour? Well, looking at all the relevant passages, it seems very clear that the last hour is the time between Christ's first coming and his second coming. So we, like John's original readers, are in the last times. But there will also be last times to these last times, the final minutes of the last hours, if you will, before the final judgment in Christ's eternal kingdom. Now, as a side note, great Bible scholars disagree about the details of the last days. In fact, there are many different views in this church about how exactly these last days will work out. And that's okay. This should not be a test for Christian fellowship. In our church's doctrinal statement, we just affirm that Christ will come back someday, not how that timeline works out exactly. Well, why does John reference the last hour? I believe he's trying to give us a sense of urgency. What we do in our short little lives matters. It's easy for us to be distracted by our temporary wants and concerns and our worries, that we forget uh, that we live in important times and that Christ has a mission for us to accomplish. In my earlier sermon in the previous passage, John warned us, do not love the world, neither the things that are in the world. What a better way to reemphasize that by reminding us that this world will not last forever. This age will not last forever. It is passing away, to quote our previous passage. And we are in its last hours. But notice in verse 18 what this last hour is characterized by, how we know it's the last hour, the arising of antichrists. Point number two, the antichrists. What does the word antichrist mean? Well, we know uh, even in modern English that anti means against as in an opponent or an enemy of someone. But it can also have the meaning of a substitute to take the place of something else. And John likely has both meanings in mind. He likes double meanings. Where else do we see this word or or this idea? Well, John's letters are a primary source. In fact, he's the only New Testament author who actually uses the word antichrist. In chapter 4, verse 3, he says, Every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming and now is in the world already. And then in his second letter, 2 John, verse 4, he says, For many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh. Such a one is the deceiver and the Antichrist. Notice the many and the one. There is one, and then there are also many. All the lesser Antichrists resemble the ultimate Antichrist. Well, what is the common theme here for John? They all lie about Jesus Christ. Paul calls him the man of lawlessness in 2 Thessalonians 2. And he makes it clear that before the end of this age in Christ's return, this man of lawlessness will be revealed. He will demand worship like a god, but he will be defeated by Christ. And there is now a mystery of lawlessness, sounds a lot like spirit of Antichrist, at work in the world today. And one particular antichrist will come at the end of these last days. He will be an enemy of God, he will demand false worship, and he will be defeated. But in our passage, John wants us to understand that he has many, or plural, antichrists in mind. Antichrist with an S on the end. There will be many, there are many. Now, what does that mean? Is there some spiritual force in the world that influences certain people? Is there a succession of political or religious leaders throughout history? Uh, Are there people who are demon-possessed? It sounds like something from a sci-fi or fantasy novel. The simplest explanation is that there are human beings who, for whatever reason, seek to oppose Christ. They reject Christ, and they lie about Christ, and they foreshadow an ultimate enemy of Christ. Well, what are the antichrists doing in this passage that we're looking at today? How can we identify them? What should we be wary of? Why should we be cautious? This pas- in this passage, the antichrists are those who A, leave the faith, B, deny Christ, and C, try to deceive Christians. They leave the faith. No, uh, notice verse 19. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain that they all are not of us. Now, this isn't talking about people who decide to go to another local church because they feel it's a better fit for them. Or 
it's not talking about people who are going through something very difficult, whether they're struggling with sin or they're in despair, and they just don't feel like going to church. Although that is the worst thing you can do when you're going through something is to avoid your church family and Christian community. What he's talking about is people who leave the faith. They reject the core truths of Christianity, like the deity of Christ, or the humanity of Christ, the Trinity, or sin, the fact that there are certain things that are right and wrong, or justification by faith alone. They no longer pass the truth test. What we believe as a church and as individuals matters. What we feed our minds on matters. This is why we have a doctrinal statement. This is why we practice church discipline. Well, letter B, they also deny Christ. Look at verses 22 and 23. Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist. He who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. They deny Christ. In this context, they certainly deny the deity of Christ, that Jesus is God. But they also might deny other things about Christ, or they might just minimize truth about Christ. They might say something like, doctrine divides, but Christ unites. But if you don't know the truth, how do you know you have the real Christ? How do you know you have the true Christ? Letter C, they try to deceive Christians. Verse 26, I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you. They are deceptive. They are false teachers. Notice we say try, and John says try here, because they will not ultimately succeed. True Christians will endure to the end. The fancy theological term for that is they will persevere. And this is why Kyle and I are very careful about who we let speak here and what authors, preachers, and teachers we recommend. We as elders have a special sacred duty from God to guard the teaching that takes place here at Faith Family Church. Truth matters. Does it matter to you? Do you know your Bible well enough to spot people who are trying to deceive you? So there are antichrists, people who abandon the truths of Christianity and they oppose Christ in one way or another. But there's another group of people in this passage, the anointed or the anointed ones. Point number three, the anointed. Well, what does the word anointed mean? Literally, it means to have oil poured on your head. And I think, well, that's kind of weird. Uh, what's the significance of having oil poured on your head? Well, the significance is it's a, it was a way throughout the Old Testament and other ancient cultures to show that someone was chosen. They were commissioned, sort of like an officer is commissioned in the army today, or they are set apart for a position or responsibility or mission. So if you look throughout the Old Testament, prophets were anointed, priests were anointed, kings were anointed. Hmm. What does that sound like? Prophets, priests, and kings. Yes, in the Old Testament, there is a special anointed one. He's called the Messiah. The Hebrew word Messiah literally means anointed one. And the, the, New, the Old Testament, there are, there's a, a strain of prophecies that are talking about one particular Messiah who will come and he will deliver his people and he will deliver them from their sins. So in the New Testament, we have the term Christ. The, the Greek word Christos is basically a translation of the Hebrew word Messiah, the anointed one. And so I don't want to presume on anyone's Bible knowledge, but Christ is not Jesus' last name. It is a title. To say Jesus Christ is to affirm that Jesus is that, that promised one. Jesus Christ was specially chosen and set apart to be the great deliverer. Only he did not deliver from earthly oppression, at least in his first coming. He delivered from sin all those who would turn from their sins and trust in him alone. Well, seems like a, a great question to ask, but how do I know if I'm one of these anointed? Two points, A and B. How you know if you are one of these anointed? A, you've been anointed. Duh, right? Look at verse 20. But you have been anointed by the Holy One, and you all have knowledge. Well, what does it mean to be anointed by the Holy One? I think other passages really help here. 2 Corinthians 1, 21 through 22 uh, says this, and it is God who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us and who has also put his seal on us and given us his spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. We are anointed by God through Christ and then we receive the Holy Spirit. Even in the Old Testament, one of the most important anointings of all time, King David, involved the work of the Holy Spirit. In 1 Samuel 16, verse 13, it says this, Then Samuel 
took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. But even in today's passage, we have an important clue. Look at verse 25. And this is the promise that he made to us, eternal life. Who is the us here? Well, that's the anointed. That's who John is speaking to. And who has eternal life? John states very clearly in all his writings, those who believe in Jesus have eternal life. Or as Paul would put it, those who have faith in Christ have been justified and they will be glorified. So being anointed by the Holy One means having the Holy Spirit living inside you. Now, it's possible here that it's talking about our regeneration, how the Holy Spirit makes people who are spiritually dead alive by the, uh, his work. But it almost certainly refers to those who have the, the Spirit living within them, the indwelling Holy Spirit. Now, I think it's important to take a quick uh, doctrinal pause here and talk about the Holy Spirit. He is the third person of the Trinity. We have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He is co-equal with the Father and the Son, but his role is often behind the scenes. He awakens spiritually dead people. He helps us understand the truth of God's word. He comforts believers. He indwells, literally lives on the inside of all who believe in Jesus. And he helps us remember the words of Christ. He is a seal of our being owned by God, and his presence in our lives is the guarantee or the down payment that we will one day be glorified. Friends, If you have repented of your sins and placed your faith in Christ alone, you have been anointed by the Holy One, and you have the Holy Spirit living within you. So you've been anointed, and B, you have the truth. Uh, Look at verse uh, 20 and 21. But you have been anointed by the Holy One, and you all have knowledge. I write to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and because no lie is of the truth. What truth is he talking about here? specifically the truth about Christ, especially in this passage, his deity, that he is God. But it's also, uh, but it is the truth that the Antichrist deny that Jesus is the Christ. Well, what are we supposed to do with this truth once we have it? Look at verse 24. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. Skip down to verse 27. But the anointing that you received from him abides in you, and you have no need that anyone should teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about everything and is true and is no lie, just as it has taught you, abide in him. Keep that truth inside you. Let it abide in you. Literally, let it live inside you. To paraphrase a U.S. senator from California, let the dogma of Christ live loudly in you. And if that truth lives in us, we will have the Son. And if we have the Son, we have the Father also. So these anointed ones have the Spirit and they have the truth. Notice that there is no contradiction here between the Holy Spirit and the truth, and there never will be. They are not the same thing, but they are closely related. You can't have one without the other. The Holy Spirit helps us understand the truth. He reminds us of the truth. He gives us confidence in the truth, and he never conflicts with the truth. In fact, the Bible is very clear. The Holy Spirit was the primary mover through human beings to write the inspired scriptures. Well, we have the truth. The truth is how we know about the Holy Spirit. And the truth is the fuel for the Holy Spirit fire in our lives. In parallel passages, uh, in two of his letters, Paul says, in one place, be filled with the Spirit, and in the other, he says, let the words of Christ dwell in you richly. And he's not saying this because they're the exact same thing, but he is saying that because they're closely related. The more truth you have inside you, the more the Holy Spirit can work in and through you. Unfortunately, many people today who overemphasize the role of the Holy Spirit typically minimize the truth. And so you can spot right away that they really don't have the Spirit in their lives if they minimize truth, because the Holy Spirit and the truth never conflict. Finally, in this passage, there is an interesting play on words. We have one antichrist and many antichrists, just as there is one Christ, one anointed one, and many anointed ones, many Christians. There are, which the word Christian literally means little Christs. So there is one anointed one and many anointed ones. There is one anti-anointed one and many anti-anointed ones, which raises a question. Are we Christians living like Christ the way these antichrists are living like the antichrist? 
I've got three short applications today uh, before we close. Application number one, truth matters. Does it matter to you? Do you care about truth? Do you seek it? How much of your daily and weekly schedule is devoted to pursuing truth? If your schedule has changed because of the coronavirus, has spending more time pursuing truth even crossed your mind? Don't misunderstand. By saying here that we don't need teachers, uh, that, that it, or that we don't need that anyone should teach us, it's not saying that we have no need for teaching or study. Far from it. The Bible constantly speaks of the importance of teaching and of learning. What he's telling us here is we don't need anything but the simple truths of Christianity. You don't need anything but Scripture and the gospel to know God and to live your life for his glory. Not that there's not other, uh, other valuable information in the world today, but that all you need is the Scripture and the gospel to know God and to live a life that pleases him. And anyone who says otherwise is a false teacher and possibly an antichrist. The most important truth, of course, is the truth of the gospel, how our sins can be forgiven through faith in Christ. Application number two, the Holy Spirit is real. How is your relationship with him? Notice I say him and not it. He is not a force like in Star Wars. He is a person, a person who, if we are a true Christian, we have a very intimate personal relationship with. He comforts us. He goes alongside us. He helps us understand God's word, and he brings to our remembrance the words of Christ. He's grieved when we sin, and he can even be quenched. Christian, how is your relationship with the Holy Spirit? Have you neglected your relationship with him? Have you been ghosting the Holy Ghost? Has your unconfessed sin been straining your relationship? Non-Christian friends, you have no relationship with the Holy Spirit. You must accept the gospel, turn from your sins, and turn to Christ to even begin to have this relationship. And if you have questions about that, would you please ask one of us? Application number three, it is the last hour. Are you living like it? Do you have a sense of urgency in your Christian life, or are you just killing time? What is distracting you? Relationships, relaxation, careers, kids, sin? Are you more concerned with the needs and wants and desires and worries of this life, or are you dedicated to your mission? You have an important mission. Your mission is to bring glory to the eternal, immortal God during your brief mortal life. Frodo and Sam made it to Mount Doom. The ring was cast into the fire and destroyed. Sauron's power was destroyed, and his army soon would be. Frodo and Sam stumbled out onto a rock as molten lava poured all around them, and they just waited to die. But they were rescued, snatched up by eagles. They got to see the crowning of the new king and the glory of his kingdom. And when it was all over, they went home. Frodo's faithful friend had been with him every step of the way. And then one day, Frodo was welcomed into the presence of the eternal elves in a paradise beyond the sea. So will it be for believers. Once our race is run, our trials and sufferings will be over. We will be welcomed into our heavenly home of eternal rest and eternal joy. We will receive rewards, and we will give glory to God. Every tear will be wiped away, and death and sorrow, and even sickness will be no more. God will look to his faithful child and say, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. Let's close in prayer. Lord, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for the caution it gives us, how it urges us to live our lives for your glory and not to waste our lives. Thank you, Lord, for the confidence it gives us in the truth, the confidence in the truth incarnate, especially Jesus Christ, the righteous, who died in the place of sinners so that we could have cleansing from our sins and we could have the Holy Spirit living inside us until we reach that golden shore where we are glorified and live with you forever and ever. Lord, I pray for each member of this congregation that they would be comforted, that they would be encouraged, and that they would be protected Help all Christians, the global church, Lord, to shine during this time of fear and concern and anger, uh, that we would shine brightly as we love each other and as we show love for the world around us. May we be a uh, uh, testament to the love of Christ to them. Pray that you be glorified in all we do and say, for it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen.